We are now discussing the cranial cavity. Before we open the cranial cavity, you have to know that the clavera or the skull cap bones are formed of two layers an outer compact one and inner compact one with a spongy one in between. What we can see here is the diploic veins which lies between these two lamella, the outer and the inner one. This diploic vein will drain the skull bones but the important point here to remember is that it communicates with the veins outside the skull by the missionary veins and also it will communicate with the veins inside the skull. So the missionary vein will be now connected with those outside, veins outside with the veins inside and also with the diploic veins. Once you remove the the skull cap here as you can see you can see the dura mater the outer layer of the dura mater with the meningeal veins and arteries meningeal vessels radiating on its surface as you can see here that is the superior sagittal sinus which is open to show the arachnoid villi and granulations those responsible for absorbing the cerebrospinal fluid back to the bloodstream. Then when we reflect the dura matter itself, the two layers of the dura, now we can see the arachnoid on the undersurface of the dura and we can see the cerebral vessels, mainly the veins which we can see here and also the arteries radiating on the surface of the hemispheres within the subarachnoid space. That's how it looks like the central nervous system, the brain within the skull cavity, with the brain stem, then the spinal cord here, the cerebellum on the back of the brain stem, just to show that the spinal cord will end at the lumbar two with the biomatter, both of them at the uh, disc between the first and second lumbar, upper border of the second. The biomatter also will terminate at the same level but continue at the phylum terminal. The dura and the arachnoid will end at the level of the second sacral piece. The spinal dura matter, the characters are being a dense fibrous membrane that encloses the spinal cord and the coda equina. The coda equina is the lower enlarged part of the spinal cord. Above is attached to the circumference of the foramen magnum and below it becomes thinner at the level of the sacral two and it invests the phylum terminal to be attached with it with the phylum terminal at the back of the coccyx. On each side it is continuous with the external membrane of the spinal nerves at the intervertebral foramina where it ends by fusing to the sides of this foramen. The spinal arachnoid matter it is a thin and delicate tubular membrane loosely investing the spinal cord. Above it is continuous with that of the cerebral, cerebral arachnoid matter. 
it ends also at the level of the second piece of sacrum that is the spinal arachnoid matter between the arachnoid and the biomatter there is the subarachnoid space which contains the cerebrospinal fluid and the blood vessels surrounding and sublying the brain and the spinal cord within the subarachnoid space there is some dilatation at certain positions named cisterns the largest of them is what we call it the terminal cistern and that one starts at the level of the end of the spinal cord at the level of the second lumbar and extends down until the lower end of the arachnoid matter which is at the level of the second piece of sacrum that large space which contains cerebrospinal fluid and some blood vessels also contains the nerves of the cord equina the lower lumbar the sacral and the coxial nerves and this space also is the place the best site for a lumbar puncture and there is multiple multiple uses of this lumbar puncture that is the approach of the lumbar spinal puncture the lumbar puncture just to do any maneuver either anesthesia or medication or sample whatsoever this is to approach the terminal sister the needle usually goes either between the third and fourth or the fourth and fifth lumbar vertebrae here is the cisterns which are found in the cranial cavity they are the large one is the cerebellum medullary cistern on the back of the medulla between the medulla and the cerebellum the second one is the chiasmal or chiasmatic cistern at the optic chiasma the third one is the interpeduncular cistern which is found at the interpeduncular fossa of the midbrain and the pontine cistern which is found at the pontomedullary angle and there is other small cisterns around but these are the important cistern found that diagram shows how to approach the cisterna magna from the back and now that shows the needles going to the cisterna magna it that approach is just below the foramen magnum above the atlas at that space where the needle show to drain the cerebrospinal the spinal biomatter is a delicate vascular membrane which closely invests the spinal cord it gives the glistening shape or appearance of both the spinal cord and the cerebral hemispheres with the brain stem it is very closely attached or fixed to the surface of the spinal cord and the brain there is a ligament which we call it the denticulate ligament which consists of 20 pairs of triangular ligaments that's why we call it denticulate on each side extending from the spinal cord 
on each side between anterior and posterior roots of the spinal nerves. It ends by fusing with the spinal dura mater at the intervertebral foramina. Those ligaments help in fixing position of the spinal cord. The phylum terminal is the lower part of the biomatter, is an extension from it beyond the conus medullaris, and this conus medullaris is the lower enlargement of the spinal cord. Out of that enlargement come the spinal nerves, the lower lumbar and sacral, which we call them all the coda equina. The intracranial hemorrhages. Usually there is three types, extradural or epidural, subdural and subarachnoid. The extradural or epidural, the collection of the blood between the bones of the skull, the clavera usually, and the dura mater, the preostal, the, the endoostal layer. And this usually accompanied by fracture of the skull bones. Second type, the subdural, is found between the dura and the arachnoid matter. The third one is the subarachnoid hemorrhage, where the blood will be in the subarachnoid space, which will flow around the whole brain and extend to the spinal cord, can extend the spinal cord with the cerebrospinal fluid. That is the nerve supply of the dura mater, the outer layer of the dura mater. The dura mater is formed of outer layer and inner layer. The outer layer is not a true meningeal layer. It is the proostium on the inner surface of the skull bones. We have the pericranium outside, the endoosteal or the outer layer of dura inside, they surround completely the bones of the skull and come continuous through the sutures of the skull until these sutures are closed and ossified. The outer layer is sensitive, being supplied by somatic nerves, while the inner layer is insensitive, supplied by autonomic nerves. The nerve supply of the dura, as shown here, is mainly by the branches of the trigeminal nerve. Some other nerves will share in the supply of the dura matter, mainly the, the vagus and the hypoglossal, and some cervical, second and third cervical. Some examples are here, the anterior somoidal, the posterior somoidal, branches of the nasillary of the ophthalmic nerve, meningeal branch directly coming from the maxillary nerve, the mandibular nerve, meningeal branch of the mandibular, which is this nervous spinosis, to the anterior and the middle cranial fossa. There is a branch also from the current branch of the ophthalmic nerve going down to the back in the posterior cranial fossa. Branches through the foramen magnum from the cervical vertebrae here, cervical nerves here, and from the hypoglossal nerve and the vagus nerve. These are all somatic the supply of the dura mater. Considering the cerebral dura mater, it's formed of two layers, outer layer and inner layer, as we said. The outer layer is the endoosteal layer, and it is not part of the meninges. It is the preostium on the inner surface of 
the skull bones as we said the inner layer is the true meningeal layer and this inner layer give a number of folds which will separate the different parts of the brain inside that is number one for the function of the inner layer number two between the inner layer and the outer layer there is some spaces which are formed for venous circulation inside the skull cavity the cranial cavity and this is the dural sinus the outer layer and the inner layer are very much attached to each other fused together except at the places where these dural sinuses are formed some other dural sinuses are formed between or within the inner layer itself we are going to talk about the dural folds which are coming or formed by the inner layer the first one is the falx cerebri number one number two is the tentorium cerebelli number three is the cerebellar falx or the falx cerebelli and number four is the diaphragma cellae which covers the pituitary fossa or the hypophysial fossa there is a fifth one which lies at the apex of the petrous part of temporal bone covering the trigeminal ganglia called cavum trigeminal these are the main five folds of the dura mater the falx cerebri the largest one is formed of or it has three borders with an apex and base on the right it is shown the superior border attached to the undersurface of the vault of the skull it's strongly attached to that part of the vault of the skull inferior border will arch over the corpus callosum as will be shown in the next slide the apex is attached to the crestagalli part of the ethmoid bone and the frontal crest the internal frontal crest the base is attached to the upper surface of the tentorium cerebelli this base raises the tentorium cerebelli to look as a tent as shown in the most left figure the falx cerebelli is pulling up the tentorium cerebelli that falx cerebelli has a very important function being attached to the fault of the skull and attached by its base to the tentorium cerebelli the two cerebellar hemispheres are lying on each side of that falx on the upper surface of the tentorium cerebelli so they are deaf, they are hanged to the undersurface of the vault of the skull their weight is prevented by the tentorium which is hold or holded by the falx cerebri from pressing on the structures on the posterior cranial fossa namely the cerebellum and the brainstem the important part here is the brainstem because if this falx cerebri fails to raise the cerebral spheres their weight will push down the uh, the medulla oblongata to herniate out through the foramen magnum that medulla have the cardiac centers and the respiratory centers and could be a fatal thing 
if that weight of the cerebral hemisphere does not hold by the falcon prime. And this is the case in increased intracranial pressure. The pressure of intracranial, the intracranial can push the medulla out and press on those vital centers. Along the upper border of the falx cerebri, there is the superior sagittal sinus. Along the inferior border, there is the inferior sagittal sinus. And along the base is the straight sinus. The figure in the middle shows the relation of three folds together. The tentorium cerebelli give attachment by its upper surface to the base of the falx cerebri. The undersurface of the tentorium cerebelli give attachment to the falx cerebelli, which is a very small fold attached to the internal occipital crest posteriorly, superiorly to the undersurface of the tentorium cerebelli, anteriorly it bulges within or in between the two cerebellar hemispheres. Along its free border, the occipital sinus will be running. So the relation between the first, the falx cerebri, the second, the tentorium, and the third is well shown in that middle finger. In the falx cerebri, as shown in this slide, on the left side, the section of the brain stem and the corpus callosum is shown. So the, the inferior border arching over the corpus callosum, superior border, as we said, attached to the undersurface of the vault of the skull, a very strong attachment. That on the right side shows again both the base attached to the tentorium cerebelli and the superior border and the apex, which is a second shaped here, attached to the cresta gallery. That is the falx cerebri and the tentorium cerebelli. The tentorium cerebelli, as we have seen it, having an upper surface attached or give attachment to the base of the falx cerebri. Inferior surface which give attachment to the falx cerebelli. The falx cerebri is pulling it upward, so the upper surface looks like a tent. It has a touched border and free border. The touched border is attached to the sides of the posterior cranial fossa to the posterior border of the petrous part of temporal bone and the sides of the groove for transverse sinus on the occipital bone. The free border lodges the midbrain, surround the midbrain, the upper part of the brain stem. The free border and the attached border are attached to what we call it the clinoid processes. The free border will cross the attached border to reach the anterior clinoid process, which is a part of the root of the lesser wing of the sphenoid. While the attached border will give attachment, will be attached to the posterior clinoid process on the sides of the dorsum cilli on the body of the sphenoid. That's how it looks like the tentorium cerebelli. But the point of crossing between the free border and the attached border is the landmark for cranial nerve course. The course of any cranial nerve will come from the brainstem, from its origin, to pierce the bile, the arachnoid, and the dura, the covering of the brain stem. So at the point of crossing, here is the trochlear nerve piercing the dura mater. In front of the crossing, here is the oculomotor 
crossing the piercing the dura mater, coming out. Behind the crossing on the sides of the posterior cranial fossa, the trigeminal nerve will be piercing the dura mater. On the clavus of the skull, where the bones and the midbrain will be lying, the abducens nerve will pierce the dura mater. The tentorum cerebelli and the attached border, there is the transverse sinus and the superior petrosal sinus. In the middle of the upper surface, there is the straight sinus. So it's related or give boundaries or attachment to the three sinuses. The superior petrosal along the anterior part of the attached border, the transverse sinus along the posterior part, and the straight sinus at the upper surface. Now for the dural venous sinuses. As we said, the dural venous sinuses are places or spaces between the outer and the inner layer of the dura mater. They have some characters. They have no valves. There is no muscle layers within their walls compared with the veins. So it's more smooth from inside. Being valveless, the bloodstream can go either from back to front or from front to back. If there is any pressure on the front, the blood can go to the back. Tumor whatsoever. If there is another pressure on the back, again a tumor or something, the blood can go to the front. So this help in releasing the intracranial pressure from the venous side. The dura, dura and venous sinus usually are classified into single and bird. The bird venous signs are on the posterior border of the lesser wing of the sphenoid, the sphenoparietal or sphenoorbital on each side, which will join the ophthalmic vein to form the cavernous sinus on each side. The cavernous sinus will be divided into superior petrosal and inferior petrosal. Along the attached border of the internal cerebral line, the transverse sinus will be there. The transverse sinus will end up in sigmoid sinus. So the birth are the sphenoparietal, the two cavernous, the two subir petrosal, the two inferior petrosal, the transverse sinus, and the sigmoid sinus. Now the single sinuses, they are the superior sagittal along the upper border of the fac cerebri, as we said, the inferior sagittal sinus along its inferior border, the straight sinus along the base of the falx cerebri on the upper surface of the tentorium, the occipital sinus along the free border of the falx cerebral line, the basilar sinuses on the clavus of the skull, a number of sinuses between the outer and the inner layer. And lastly, the intercavernous sinuses. There are two anterior and posterior connecting the two cavernous sinuses on each side behind the pituitary gland. That is the single sinuses. The circulation of the dural sinuses are starting from the front to the back and then from the back to the middle. 
down to the neck through the internal jugular vein. That is the circulation. Starting from the superior sagittal sinus, it will join mainly in over 75 or 80 percent, join the right transverse to the right sigmoid to the right internal jugular. In this case, the severe petrosal will join the straight sinus, receiving the great cerebral and the occipital sinus to join the left transverse to the left submoid to the left internal jugular. And in this case, the size of the internal jugular on the right side would be larger than that of the left side. In less around 10% or 15%, it is reversed, where the superior sagittal sinus will join the left transverse sinus to the left submoid, to the left internal jugular vein, and the others will join the right transverse to the right submoid to the right internal jugular. In this case, the left internal jugular will be larger than the right one. In 5%, 10%, the two transverse sinus will join each other and receive the superior sagittal, the straight with the inferior sagittal, with the great cerebral vein, with the occipital vein, and what we call it venous confluence. And this will be distributed equally on each side to the right and left transverse to the right and left sigmoid, to the right and left internal jugular. In this case, both veins, right and left internal jugular, will be of the same size. The inferior betrosal sinus will go out through the internal jugular or the jugular foramen to join the internal jugular vein. That is the circulation of these sinuses. Here we can see three types of the venous dural sinuses termination in an angiogram. On the upper right one, the superior sagittal join the left internal jugular or left transverse first to the internal jugular. Here, the left internal jugular vein looks larger. On the other side, the lower right one, superior sagittal joins the right one, where it will be larger than the left one. On the left, the two transverse sinuses meet in a confluence, receiving the superior sagittal, inferior sagittal, straight, and other veins. So both of them, the entire jugular on each side, are almost of the same size. In the superior sagittal sinus, the main feature is the arachnoid villi and the granulations. Here is the arachnoid granulations here, and this small villi can be the collection of villi can be forming a granulation over here. And that's how it looks like on the surface of the brain, the arachnoid granulations along the side of the superior sagittal sinus. These arachnoid granulations and, and villi will bring the subarachnoid space into the superior sagittal sinus cavity. That is here the pia, that is the arachnoid, and here is the subarachnoid space here. That is the dura mater here. Dura, arachnoid, and pia. So subarachnoid will be in within the venous stream for absorption of the cerebrospinal fluid. The important one sinus within the cranial cavity is the cavernous sinus. It is found on each side of the body of the sphenoids and the sides of the pituitary gland, as we can see. This cavernous sinus has important relations and communications. It's formed by the union of the ophthalmic veins and the sphenoparietal sinus. And 
found on each side of the bodice from what as we said its cavity is divided into different small cavities that's why we call it cavernous its wall is double layer and there is some nerves embedded in the walls it ends by dividing into severe petrosal and fear petrosal sinuses its communication is very important it receives a lot of number of emissary veins from different foramina the most important of them are the ophthalmic vein through the superior oral fissure and the trigoid plexus of veins these two sites are very important the trigoid plexus of veins which is found in the infratemporal and the trigobalatine fossae which drains important areas at the mouth the pharynx the larynx the teeth part of the tongue and infection is very common among these sites also the ophthalmic veins which drains the area of the face one of them is the dangerous area which is bounded by the superior ciliary super ciliary uh, arches or the eyebrows and the angle of the mouse this is the dangerous what we call a dangerous area of the face infection through these two sites is very common and can occur and it leads to infection of the cavernous sinus and this is a very serious condition which can lead even to death the symptoms and the presentation of infection of the cavernous sinus can be presented by the affection of the nerves found in the lateral wall which are the oculomotor the trochlear the ophthalmic and the maxillary nerves and in the floor the abducens nerve the oculomotor the trochlear and the abducens are the three nerves motor nerves for the muscles of the eyeball and infection or affection of the cavernous sinus can be presented by altering any movements of the eyeball also affection of the ophthalmic the maxillary can be presented by neuralgia on the face the relations of the cavernous sinus here is the contents of the cavernous sinus and the relations medially the pituitary gland will be there and the body and the sphenoidal air sinuses within the body of the sphenoid lateral will be the angus of the temporal bone the temporal lobe of the brain inferiorly will be the body of the sphenoid Superiorly will be the interpeduncular fossa of the midbrain containing the intercord artery and other contents. Within the cavernous sinus itself, in the lateral wall, as we said, the oculomotor, the trochlear, the ophthalmic, and the maxillary nerve. In the floor, the intercord artery and lateral to it, the abducens nerve. Inferior laterally is the trigeminal ganglion, where we said infection within the cavernous sinus will affect this ganglion, which can lead to neuralgia of the face. That's how it looks like the intercarotid artery as it reaches the cranial cavity, passing through the carotid canal upwards, and then forwards and medially abus then forms immediately then in the upper opening of the this is the foramen lacerum